All right, so sort of talk about some uh, means of classifying microbes. And uh, one of the ways that we can classify them is based off of their morphology, which is something that we've already kind of talked about um, in, in some detail anyways, <clears throat> using of, I guess there's ways that we could branch these bad boys up underneath. Oh, there is the cocci, bacilli, and then there's the spirilla, spirilla. Um, what all does this mean in English though? Cocci is anything that is spherical. Uh, bacilli, I'm just going to go ahead and change these if you think that the two L's and bacilli as being a the end of it. This is, gives us a rod type of a shape, uh, whereas with the cocci, if, in case you couldn't tell what that is, <laughs> this is a spherical shape. And then lastly, so the spirilla gives us this, um, you know, I guess you could call it a helical or a corkscrew, corkscrew type of a shape. And the interesting thing about these is that we can combine, um, say I combine a bacilli and a spirilla, well then I'll get a heliobacterium, you know, like the the infamous H. pylori. Lori. It's really <laughs> kind of hard to see. But anyways, that's one of the ways that we can classify them. We can also classify them based off of their uh, metabolic properties. Metabolism. We can, you know, are they going to help aid in the nitrogen cycle? And, th and this is actually metabolism, but it's also related to, I guess, to a lesser extent to the, its role that it has on ecology. Uh, is it a chemotroth, heterotroph, lithotroph, all those wonderful words. Does it have nitrogenase or not? Is it photosynthetic or not? And that's one of the ways that we can classify them. We can also classify bacteria based off of whether or not they make us sick, whether or not they have any pathogenic abilities. And this is actually where a lot of our, our, our I guess, our, our terminologies come from. So, you know, if I am infected with... Um, you know, Nesera gonorrhea, I'm going to have the disease gonorrhea. <laughs> or gonorrhea, I'm going to have the disease gonorrhea. And that's where a lot of these, I guess, the terminologies of this come from. You know, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis causes the disease tuberculosis. So a lot of these, these classifications kind of have stuck with us for a while. Um, but there is a bit of a problem, uh, and that's being that this has no... Um, uh, connection to uh, evolution, so no evolutionary connection. And um, it, the, one of the things that makes learning biology so really makes it easy is that having natural selection evolution is that you have a central unifying theory to where it doesn't really matter if you're studying genetics or if you're studying microbiology or if you're studying ecology, everything is connected by that. So if we don't have any means of connecting our bacteria, how we classify them, that can be kind of problematic. What are, one of the things that has kind of kind of made this difficult, I think, in understanding um, is is how we define, uh, I guess, uh, species, and but but really, I guess, in, in the context of bacteria, they don't really have sex. There's no, <laughs> there's not a male, and then there's not a female um, bacteria. They have biological sex, and that they can transfer, you know, genes from one area to the next through conjugation. But they don't have sexes. So this kind of, I guess, led to some trouble and guess, difficulties among scientists. This next slide would be a, a good indication. So the ribosomal RNA is what separates eukaryotes, archaea, and bacteria. All and that drastically separates us. So in, even in eukaryote, in, in eukaryotes, in, in you and me, there's there is mitochondria. Uh, where did these mitochondria come from? Well, their, their ribosomal RNA tells us that they came from alpha proteobacterium. Proteobacteria. That's an R. So, alpha proteobacteria, uh, archaea have their own unique ribosomes, and then bacteria have their own unique ribosomal RNA. And that is what separates all of these, uh, I guess, phyla into one. This is also why you can take an antibiotic and it may inhibit the ribosomal RNA of bacteria, but it's not going to do anything to you or even into your mitochondria because there is a difference between those two. And that was a huge discovery.
All right, so now let's talk about, uh, I guess, <laughs> the type of gram-positive bacteria. One of the things that we use really often to separate bacterium is their gra reaction to gram staining. Is it gram-positive or is it gram-negative? So again, we're kind of going back to morphology here. But cyanobacteria, a.k.a. blue-green algae, and there's lots of things that it has that make it um, very well known, I guess, in terms of biology. I guess the most... Uh, I guess the most interesting thing about it is that it was a endo symbiont, and this is what led gave plants their. Um, I was going to say plasts, but I guess I'll be more specific here. This is what gave them their chloroplasts in plants. That's one of the places where we got cyanobacteria. One of the things that the contributions they made in terms of evolution. Um, another thing that they're really good at doing is. Nitrogen fixating. Fixating. I just I get I suppose I should probably clarify and I'll do this in green. If it's if it comes from the chloroplast in plants, we know that it is going to most likely be photosynthetic. Synthetic. Can't spell to save my life, but that's how that works. So let's just kind of switch gears also to nitrogen fixation. So as you know, diatomic nitrogen is what makes up about 78% of our Earth's atmosphere. And because of this really crazy strong triple bond there, it's <laughs> hard to break that. And so there's, up until the Haber process was invented, there wasn't really any means of, of, of helping it. But there's an enzyme that bacteria have, in this case cyanobacteria, called nitrogenase. How wonderful of a name for it. And what this can do is this can uh, convert that, I guess I'll do it in blue, to um, you know, NH3 or some type of metabolically active form of nitrogen, uh, which is uh, pretty beneficial in terms of understanding ecology as well because it plays a huge role in the nitrogen cycle. Um, also, they can clump together in you know other types of nitrifying uh, cyanobacteria can clump together to form something called a heterocyst. Heterocyst. And what this is, is it's basically, I think of it, I'll just, I'll draw it over here. I have a cyanobacterium, I have a cyanobacterium, I have a cyanobacterium, and they all start getting together, and they're all doing this nitrogen fixating uh, reaction here, and they all have these thick uh, clumps up together like this. And this is generally a good thing, but the, uh, I guess one of the things that I really want to point out is that they have these thick walls, thick walls. Why do they have to have that though? I guess is to protect it because if oxygen were to get into this, oxygen will inhibit um, the gene expression of nitrogenase or it may in fact inhibit the nitrogenase enzyme itself. My book doesn't really say. Um, I would assume that it would inhibit the gene expression by some other indirect pathway, but I, that's just speculative at this point. Purple sulfur bacteria is the last thing that we're going to talk about. Let's just kind of have a, a general, very general overview of photosynthesis, I guess, in terms of uh, importance here. So here's that. That's going to be our enzymes here. So we have a photosystem here. In this case, it's photosystem 2. You don't need to know that. Photosystem 1, uh, this enzyme here is going to be NADP reductase because it reduces... ADP, and then lastly, ATP synthase. This isn't really something that I'm, I'm not trying to teach the process of photosynthesis here. But remember, whenever this gets hit by a photon of light and it starts to donate an electron down this chain, which causes this whole reaction to happen. Once this photosystem, it's a protein, and it loses its electron, think about when you're putting a hydrogen peroxide on a cut. Well, if it's losing an electron, that's damaging to its electron density, and this is therefore its three-dimensional structure. So this could, you know, mess up its its function. And it's, it it saves itself from doing this though by taking H2O, by taking water, and splitting it uh, up into other parts. And so one, it's going to take an electron from water and hydrogen protons. These are one of the you know few stable elements that can lose their electrons, and then oxygen, which will diffuse out into the uh, rest of the part of the cell for other purposes um, that are metabolically, we're not really interested in that. Uh, in the instance of purple sulfur bacteria though, 
uh, instead of using oxygen, instead of using H2O, they can use H2S for that exact same thing. It can donate an electron to that and will give it hydrogen protons and sulfur out here into the medium. And so that's one of the things that purple sulfur bacteria do because oxygen and sulfur are, uh, they're, they're both electronegative elements. And the thing that is, is really interesting about these guys is they are micro aerophilic, which may or may not be uh, familiar to you. So they, they prefer to have uh, low oxygen concentrations and relatively high concentrations of CO2. Now, why do they want to have a high concentration of CO2? Because that is one of the carbon sources for them. This is a CO2 is a carbon source for those bacteria. So that's pretty helpful and I guess useful for them. And this is, I guess, just a, a variant of a photosynthetic uh, bacterium, but its, it's metabolic pathway is very, very much different. So.